So I am Emily and I am the founder of Mighty Slice, who are a high protein dessert company disrupting the protein industry. Nice. And why why that particular business? Why did you start that? I always start off by saying that this is essentially spiraled out of control for me having the world's worst sweet tooth. <laughs> I have no shame in admitting that. Um, but I'm also super into fitness. Um, you know, I am a real foodie. And for me, food is about enjoyment and experience and sharing with friends and trying new flavors, having nice textures. And I found that I was doing these really like endorphin fueled workouts. And I'd get to the end of the workout and just think, you know, you know, I can have a protein bar or chug a protein shake. And for me, food is this real experience and a moment to enjoy. And I just felt that there was something missing in that. Did what any normal person would do and started making my own protein cheesecakes and desserts for myself and my friends at home. Um, and they just sort of went an absolute hit. And that really solved the problem for me initially. It wasn't until I started training as a lawyer and I did not have the time either end of the day to be making these protein desserts from scratch that I realized that actually... There is nothing like that in a supermarket or in a convenience store where you've got the sort of proper biscuit base, creamy cheesecake mixture and just spotted a gap really and kind of have never looked back. So yeah, it's been a crazy journey. Yeah, it sounds it. And no, you're completely right. Like I've, I've suffered from that as well. You go to look for something that's good for you and got everything you, you're looking for, but it's also nice, tasty and looks good. Like it's very hard to find. So I completely get that. Um, yeah. the, something else that looks nice is the branding. How did... How have you done that? Have you done that yourself or have you sort of outsourced it? Because it, it looks amazing. And it, it From the very beginning, when I look back, it gave the brand a real sort of legacy feel, even though it was like relatively new. So how, how much thought process did you put into the branding and whose sort of responsibility was that? Yeah, I wish I could take full credit for this. <laughs> uh, we worked with an incredible agency. I think sort of one of the things that was most important to me as much so as the recipe initially was having a brand that looked really good on shelf yeah. I think particularly with a protein product and the way that we're trying to disrupt the industry you know they are very much based on based on functionality and convenience and for me I wanted the entire thing to be an experience so even from the way that you open the packaging how it feels in your hand how it looks on your fridge you know it had to be this full-on almost aesthetic experience and um, to really kind of help our customers almost romanticize their life when it comes to just so, so something so small like your protein snacking experience I think as well with a food product um you know your packaging is this real estate and when you've got it on a supermarket shelf or a cafe shelf that is the first thing that people are going to see particularly as a small brand where they may never have tried your product before and the difference between them picking you up or someone else up and that was something that I really understood from the start. And so it has always been a massive priority. We worked with an incredible agency, but it was very much guided by this kind of very clear laser vision that I had of how I wanted the brand to feel. And they just really executed amazingly on that. So very, very grateful to work with them. The initial branding was done by myself and it did not look as beautiful as this. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have a background in art, um, but a lot of hours were spent on Pinterest, kind of scrolling through, collecting mood boards and we use those to kind of base the the end design off of essentially do you think there's a big you mentioned there like the experience that a branding can sort of have like for for the user and the consumer do you think that there's something to be said about letting your personality shine through the branding because it seems like speaking to you for the first time today and and just your overall vibe and feel it feels like that sort of portrayed through the branding like really bright bubbly powerful like that that seems to be con conveyed through that is that was that a conscious effort, do you think? Thank you. I I don't know if it was conscious. I think the product, I initially created it for myself to solve a problem for myself. So naturally, there are those kind of influences of what I would want to see. Um, but I think one thing that we've been really focusing on is sort of looking at, okay, our target audience currently is lots of Emily's, but actually there are all these other pockets of target audiences and making sure that, you know, our branding doesn't alienate anyone else and that, you know, we still retain that sort of bubbly, fun, beautiful aesthetic whilst really appealing to a much wider um, audience as well. But I think it's fun when you have your own company and you can put your own spin on things and really have a very close say in, in what the end product looks like and that's something that we've really tried to retain what did it look like in the early days when you were starting off like how in terms of the setup like was it you was it someone else like how how, how was that set up initially so 
in the very, very, very beginning, it was just myself. Um, and I very quickly realized that this was not a one man job. And so I brought on board my boyfriend, Jamie, who loved the protein cheesecakes as well, loved the concept. And it's sort of just grown from there. So we've actually ended up employing my brother and Jamie's and um, brother as well. So it's very much like a family unit at the moment. Um, I feel sorry for ever, whoever our like first employee that's external to the family is. <laughs> um but no it's really really cool to work with people that I know and love um and it just creates like a really good vibe um and a lot of trust with each other as well so the team is slowly growing and we're hoping to kind of make our first couple of proper external hires um in the coming months to really elevate the brand I'm sure it sounds like you're obviously growing quite quickly what's been the best few moments perhaps or the best moment of the journey so far I think it's really hard to choose one. Um, you can kind of quantify different achievements as sort of the further along the journey we are, the better and the bigger. But actually, I think some of those earlier moments were really, really amazing as well. You know, getting our first ever stockist who in retrospect now was so tiny and insignificant to our volume of turnover, but actually just seeing our products on the shelf for the first time was crazy to think, you know, gosh, this has literally all spiraled from just an idea that I had in my head that literally just came to me out of nowhere. Um, I think as well, literally last week, again, one of the best moments we ended up securing two nation back to back days, which was just crazy. Um, and just, yeah, we're on a real roll at the moment. But I think kind of buffering those is a lot of low moments as well. And everyone always says, entrepreneurship is a lot of highs and a lot of lows and they really aren't lying um there's a lot of low moments as well what what are some of those low moments because I've had it myself it's like that that those few moments that seem to appear every now and then where you're like I just want to qu quit completely I just want to stop I don't know whether I sh can do this or whether I should be doing this so what are some of your low moments with this journey gosh where to begin <laughs> um I don't know I I think sort of there's been a number of low moments at the start that are very different to the low moments that we have now. I think kind of as you grow, your problems get bigger. And so the problems that we're having now maybe seem small, bigger than the ones we had initially. But I think some of the lowest moments for me were at the start. Um, we initially had a recipe that I've been making in my kitchen and we really wanted to sort of make it much more shelf stable and kind of try to really change the process so, so much that we really lost the essence of what the brand and the products were. And I just remember thinking, you know, we'd spent so much money and time and development on changing the recipe only to end up with something that actually didn't taste as good as we wanted. It wasn't what I'd envisaged. I just remember thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I've spent all this time and effort and now we don't even have a product or a recipe. And that's like the main, most important thing. And so for me, that was a real stumbling block um but I think what I've realized with all problems is that you just have to keep going and the difference between the people that are kind of successful in business and aren't um there's lots of factors but one of them is definitely whether you can just try and push through problems and sometimes you'll get a problem that you can't push through and that's when the business ends but sometimes you can't just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and that's kind of the mentality that we try to attack our problems with now is the expectation that very low moments will come but let's just throw everything at them and just go at it with a lot of tenacity. No, I think that's a good point. I guess you can either push through the challenge or if you can't push through, you can pivot and do something else. Exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. What What would your advice be for, specifically for other founders of food companies? What would your sort of advice be for those guys and girls? Like, is there a particular strategy you you would advise? Like, is, is the game just going after uh like getting stockiest or is there another play that you should be looking at as a as a owner of a food brand yeah I think going after stockist is interesting because obviously that is well part of unless you do D to C that's how you sell your product and get it out there but I think one thing that we've really realized recently is there's no point getting listings unless you have a very scalable clear solution to make the product to source all of the ingredients and have that really robust supply chain to deliver it effectively at a cost price. And so all of the quote unquote boring like logistics and operations, it's actually super, super important. Um, and that's something that I'd really recommend is don't underestimate the power of that. Don't underestimate the power of getting all your ducks in a row and making sure you've got the right certifications to approach the stockists that you're speaking to um, and really making sure you've got everything in order on that end. I think that's one thing I wish we'd kind of 
have started looking at much sooner. Uh, thanks for that. And for those that aren't owners of a food brand, perhaps they're in any other space you could name. What would your advice be for for those guys and girls? Like, do you, do you have like one piece piece of advice you share with them? I think one of the things that I have found really valuable in business so far is not being afraid to do things the unconventional way. Um, I was speaking to um, lots of other kind of entrepreneurs the other day and just about our packaging and how we've chosen to put it in a triangle. And everyone has always sort of questioned it slightly, but actually it's ended up being one of our strengths as a marketing piece and for how we stand out on the shelves and how buyers respond to it. Um, and so don't be afraid to kind of not be penned into a hole and do things the dumb way, you know, as a startup, it's important to challenge the status quo. And I think that's the one thing that as a small business owner, you can really kind of take in your stride. And obviously my show is called If Only They Knew. Is there anything you wish you knew either at an earlier stage, perhaps when you first started or anything you wish you could know now that could sort of unlock something for you and get you to that next level? It's a hard one. I think one thing that I wish I knew was that everything was probably going to be okay. And even if things aren't okay in the moment, time always passes. Um, and if you just keep pushing, you, you'll probably be okay. Um, so I think there's some sort of comfort in that. And I wish that I knew that at the beginning. Um, I think it probably would have saved me from a lot of stressful nights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, and we spoke off camera um if you're able to and if you're comfortable with it are you able to just sort of go into that transition from sort of starting up and getting ready to get in the business to a point where you're able to sort of leave your job or at least look at leaving your job because I know a lot of people listening are, are at that stage where they're young perhaps in like a retail job starting something off and they want to know when when it when it is possible to make that jump and leave your job completely yeah, I think one thing I'd say is don't rush. You know, I, when I started the business was really burning the candle at both ends and it was awful at times, you know, I would be working my job and then I would be staying up really, really late and doing it really early in the morning. But, you know, sometimes you do need that stability and actually I was in a really privileged position that I was able to eventually leave my job. But, you know, for lots of people, it's so important to just, you know, not put all your eggs in one basket. Make sure that you've really validated the market. Make sure that you've got some sort of clear traction so you know that this is going to be a sustainable option for you. Um, so, yeah, just make sure that you're really sure. Um, but also, I think sometimes taking the leap if you're in that position and you've sort of got that initial traction and you have a good feeling and you're lucky enough to be able to, um, then absolutely go for it. Perfect. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. What's next? What's on the horizon for yourself and the brand? World domination. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we have got some really, really exciting big launches that we've kind of been leading up to next month and in November and January. Um, but sort of looking past that in the longer term, you know, we see Mighty Slice as this global brand that completely disrupts the industry. And I think that's sort of where we hopefully envisage ourselves in the next few years. Perfect. Like I said, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me.